Um, we're in for a treat, uh, a timely topic today. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, colleague Emily Regier, new political scientist here. Um, she's going to introduce our speaker and chair the proceedings today. I just wanted to say that we're going to have finally like a week to catch our breath. We're going to have a week off. We can all go to the true false stuff. And then the next week, is going to be our kind of annual special one. It's going to be our weird one that the undergraduate students and the undergraduate lectures committee is in charge of our next seminar. So we all want to be here for that on Friday, March 8th. Uh, but today, enough for me. Let's get over to Emily Regier. Thank you, Jay. My honor to introduce Mark Graber, Regents Professor at University of Maryland's Carey School of Law. It's also a challenge to introduce Professor Graber. Introductions tend to put people into categories, into boxes, and Professor Graber's career as well as his scholarship really can't be boxed in that way. Professor Graber started out as a political scientist at the University of Maryland in the Department of Government and Politics, where he served for over a decade before transitioning to the law school. There, he served as a professor of constitutional law since the early 2000s. Nonetheless, in 2023, he won a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Political Science Association. In between, he spearheaded the American Constitutional Development Movement, which analyzes constitutional doctrine by synthesizing approaches from law, history, and empirical political science. Early on, wearing his political scientist hat, Professor Graber challenged his peers to consider courts as political actors without reducing them solely to political actors. He published groundbreaking work on the unexpected and underappreciated power dynamics between courts and majoritarian political institutions. Later on, wearing his constitutional law hat, Professor Graber published among many celebrated pieces, the book Dred Scott and the Problem of Constitutional Evil, which forces us to reckon with the formative compromises over slavery in the Constitution and casts a searching light on modern conceptions of judicial review. To put it mildly, Professor Graber is an expert in the 14th Amendment. He has authored, among numerous law review articles, subtraction by addition, provocative exploration of the relationship between the 13th and 14th Amendments. He has also been excavating the history and significance of the forgotten sections of the 14th Amendment, long before they, or at least Section 3, came to the fore in American politics. Professor Graber's most recent book, Punish Treason, Reward Loyalty, The Forgotten Goals of Constitutional Reform After the Civil War, just came out in 2023. But closest to my heart as a political scientist, teaching courses in the constitutional law space, is Professor Graber's groundbreaking textbook series, co-authored with Howard Gilman and Keith Whittington. That series is entitled American Constitutionalism. It firmly roots constitutional thought in constitutional politics, and both in historical context. It's an amazing teaching tool, and I hasten to add that I'm often one of those learning from it. I have a feeling, although I don't want to be a spoiler, that Professor Graber is going to treat us to some of his distinctive synthesis of constitutional thought, politics, and history in his talk today. So without further ado, I give you Professor Mark Graber. Thank you, Emily. No, no. First, you know, obviously, I'm a contrarian. My job is to refute. Understand, I'm very grateful I got up from my chair because, like most academics, I'm used to speaking to empty chairs. <laughs> and I will do my best to speak to real people. And I'm really grateful 
that there are young people here, and most of you look fairly young. My definition of young, by the way, keeps increasing. <laughs> but I really believe the responsibility of senior scholars is to guide young people on their projects, not our projects. Then when they do their projects, tell them our projects were really better, <laughs> and then get out of the way. And what I want to outline today is a project I'm beginning that I hope some of you find of interest and pursue it in your way. And I'm just going to simply suggest ways it might be interesting. It begins with George Washington and the Jay Treaty. And Washington, when saying Congress had obligations to fund the Jay Treaty because treaties were law of the United States the minute signed by the President, ratified by the Senate, tough luck for the House of Representatives. And how did Washington know that? Well, he reminded everybody, I was there in the convention every day. I'm George Washington. I don't take days off. <laughs> and that was the understanding of the framing convention. James Madison responded as follows. Whatever veneration might be entertained for the body of men who formed our Constitution, the sense of that body could never be regarded as the oracular guide in expounding the Constitution. As the instrument came from them, it was nothing more than a draft of a plan, nothing but a dead letter, until life and validity were breathed into it by the voice of the people, speaking through the several state conventions. If we were to look, therefore, for the meaning of the instrument beyond the face of the instrument, we must look for it not in the general convention, which propose, but in the state conventions, which accepted and ratified the Constitution. Now, this makes in many ways a lot of sense. If, for example, you ask me for some ideas, and I give you some ideas, and you make a speech on those ideas, what's the meaning of the speech? The meaning is what you thought the ideas were, if we're an original, it's not what I thought the ideas were. You may have thought something differently, but it's your speech. The Constitution is authoritative because it was ratified by the people in the state convention. So if we're going to be a certain kind of originalist or think the original understanding ought to have some impact, it's not what the people who made the suggestion it's what the people who actually made it authoritative. This also, by the way, has a second advantage, particularly in the early 19th century. It turns out that what was said at the convention was a secret. Moreover, we've learned from Mary Builder what was later pu published may have been altered. We don't really know what was said, whereas what was said in the states was published. And in fact, you know, Madison and Hamilton, we don't see letters saying, Federalist 42 was published yesterday. They got it completely wrong. We need to put a rata in. Nobody is complaining about what was published. So we appear to have accurate publications of the debate in the states. And if we look at the literature, Madison has won that argument. I did a quick check. I found just 40 block quotes of the whole block, not just simply a little thing, in law reviews. There are probably, I would estimate, about 200, 300 uses of this phrase in the law reviews by historians political scientists, law professors. We agree ratifiers are a more authoritative source 
than framers. But only apparently with respect to the original Constitution. When we debate the original meaning of the post-Civil War Constitution, one would be hard-pressed to discover evidence it ever went to the states, because none of the major books on or articles on the original meaning of the 14th Amendment discuss anything that happened after the ratification debates. And by the way, here is a remarkable thing about the discussion. It turns out the discussion is limited to discussion of the 14th Amendment when the Congressional Globe put the header Constitutional Amendment. It turns out one of the things in my book, about 75 percent of the discussion of the 14th Amendment is under a different header. Saturday was the equivalent of open mic day at the House of Representatives. I kid you not, any representative who wanted to could come in and give an hour-long speech. And it didn't matter whether they did not have an original idea to say, I'm firmly convinced they cut it, but some people walked up and said, I'm just going to make more work for historians and repeat everything said in the last speech but you don't know that, Graeber, so you're going to have to read for another hour and learn absolutely nothing. But they talk about the 14th Amendment incessantly. But it's not in. So even our understanding of the 14th Amendment is truncated to a small part of the Congressional Globe. Sometimes we talk about the meaning of privileges, immunities, or due process in case law before the 14th Amendment or afterwards, but we know nothing, with one little exception, about the 14th Amendment in the state. Now, what we do know is the politics. There is a literature that talks about the politics. So particularly with respect to Tennessee. There was a little bit of a problem. Namely, Tennessee had a supermajority quorum law. Now, Tennessee had a majority of people who wanted to ratify, but they didn't have a majority big enough to beat the quorum. And so what Tennessee did was they located legislatures. They physically forced them in the state legislature, quite literally. They had members of the Tennessee State Guard with guns saying, you're not moving. You're part of the quorum. And Tennessee passed the 14th Amendment. We know states rescinded the 14th Amendment, but we know nothing of the debates. Think about it. I take it most of you are familiar with the Federalist Papers. What's the Federalist Papers for the post-Civil War amendments? Name one. And we know it's not simply the Federalist Papers. There were lots of other, if you've done any research. Ellsworth writes a lot. Sherman writes a lot. There's Brutus, the anti-Federalist. We know there's about 32 volumes, and all the volumes are this thick, coming out of the Wisconsin Historical Society. There are almost no materials on this. And so I thought I would take a look. And the original reason for taking a look was fortuitous. As some of you may have been involved in the effort to disqualify Donald Trump under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, you'll be blessed to know almost nothing in this talk is going to be on that. I'm actually happy since I'm writ I've written out on that. But I wrote an amicus brief for Colorado, and then I was asked to write one for Maine, 
and I was told two bits of information. One, that Maine allowed me 2,000 more words. <laughs> Always <laughs> academic, you know. We, we can write to fill the space. And second, there were 2,000 words in my Colorado brief. The Trump people had conceded, no longer needed. I now had 4,000 words. And some of that I'd simply expand on things I said, but then I had an interesting idea. Maybe the main Secretary of State would be impressed by what Maine thought about the 14th Amendment. Sort of the, you know, we have the original state of the framers, but what was the original understanding of Maine? And I began to wonder, is it the case where if you have no Supreme Court interpretation, but the amendment is first being implemented in the state, it ought to be the original understanding of the people who ratified the Constitution in that state. I decided I didn't have to answer that question, but given a quick bit of research showed that the main debates were favorable to our side, I threw them in the brief as the first example of anyone who used state debates and so one purpose is the originalism. If we say it ought to be the ratifiers, we ought to know what the ratifiers were thinking. A second purpose, good deal of my work emphasizes we shouldn't be focused on what is called original intention, but what I call almost original working. How did they expect the Constitution to work? And here, the problem is this. Most of you know I've taken the Dred Scott decision, and most of you firmly believe that the Dred Scott decision was horribly wrong, a misuse of the Constitution, and certainly all of you believe that's what Republicans thought. And that's clearly right. Republicans said, no person in good faith could reach the Dred Scott decision. But now we get to what I call the fundamental Chris Rock problem of constitutional law. And it's a Chris Rock comedy routine. And it goes like this. I am in a foreign country, and I'm lost, and I walk up to someone, and I say, where is the train station? It becomes fairly obvious this person doesn't speak English. And so what I do is I go, OK. First, I gesture madly. Meaningless, but it's mad gestures. I go more slowly. Where is, and I increase my volume. Where is the train station? And right, we're all laughing because we know that doesn't work. And yet we don't laugh at the 14th Amendment, which if we take Republicans seriously is the same strategy. Why? Republicans have just said, Democrats and slaveholders are the sort of people who no matter how clear the language, nevertheless interpret it in favor of slavery and white supremacy. So if you thought the language of the original Constitution was clear, Congress can ban slavery in the territories, why do you think saying no, slavery is illegal throughout the United States is going to be more effective, particularly when you've seen what ex-Confederate states did with the 13th Amendment? They simply reinstituted slavery and called it something else. Why would they not reinstitute slavery or under the 14th Amendment and simply call it equality? This is what we mean by equality. Lest you think I'm kidding, let's go to my favorite court, the Supreme Court of Maryland after the 14th Amendment. African-American applies to be a lawyer. Supreme Court says, nope, 
No 14th Amendment right for African Americans to be a lawyer. Why? We all know what equal, equal protection means is people cannot be treated differently unless there are real differences between them, like men and women. We all know in 1870, men and women are really different, so women can't be lawyers. Well, the court says we all know African Americans and white people are really different, and white people have that racial capacity to be a lawyer, and African Americans don't, so African Americans can't be a lawyer under the 14th Amendment. And what I want to get to is, were Republicans just stupid in overlooking this? And my project has begun with, no, maybe they weren't. Maybe what my project says is Republicans were changing the structure of constitutional politics so that, in fact, Republicans would be interpreting the 14th Amendment Section 1, who cares? Sections 2 and 3 are the important sections. Section 2 says if you disenfranchise a percentage of your male population, you lose that percentage of your representation in the House of Representatives and Electoral College. If we don't pass Section 2, former Confederate states get 30 extra representatives in the House of Representatives, 30 extra votes in the Electoral College for slaves that are former slaves that do not vote. That's enough with Democratic help to control the national government. Once we take those 30 representatives away, people say, South has a choice. You don't enfranchise African Americans. You have no power in the national government. You enfranchise African Americans. Well, now you have potential power, but if you're enfranchising African Americans, who are about half your population, you're not going to be able to use that power to enforce white supremacy. You can get railroads to come to Alabama, but not Jim Crow. Section 3, if you're a former officer, participate in insurrection, you can't be in government again. There goes the leadership class of the South, a new group of leaders. So that's what's going on in Congress. The question is, was it going on in the states? Are the states the place where we see Section 1 obsession that the 14th Amendment is about Section 1, because I presume until the recent events, right, all of us had a textbook that had the 14th Amendment, Section 1, dot, 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 Section 5. The only reason why you thought there was Sections 2, 3, and 4 was, well, there was Section 1 and Section 5. Presumably there was something in between. Who knows? Maybe somebody paid them to write five sections. They might, you know, Maybe there was something magic. But these were the important ones. So what about the states? So what I started to do was survey newspaper articles in states. And the survey began the moment the Joint Reconstruction Committee handed to Congress their draft of the 14th Amendment, which is in the last week of April. 1866, and ended approximately two weeks after that state ratified the 14th Amendment. Now, what I did, there were a lot of databases that have newspaper articles, Chronicling America, Newspaper.com, Genealogy Bank, Newspaper Archives. What I do not yet know, and I, I gather there's actually an expert in the room, is whether I've caught the highest circulation newspapers in various states. I've placed particular emphasis on speeches because Americans were great listeners, not all of them were great readers. So if we look at the crowds at the Lincoln-Douglas debates, people heard the speeches. 
Whether they read the stories, I don't know. I started with Tennessee because Tennessee had a great many advantages. First, there are lots of articles, but not too many, about 800. That's doable over a summer if you don't believe in research assistance. <laughs> Second, Tennessee has a really good diversity of opinion, at least in the newspapers I surveyed. There were those that basically said the Confederacy should have won. There were those that were pro-Johnson. There were moderate Republican, and there was even a few radical Republican newspapers thrown in. So you got the survey. Now I'll add, I'm going to Missouri. So I figured yesterday, why not take a very, very fast, down and dirty glance at Missouri? And it appears Missouri looks a lot like Tennessee, but my sample is far too small to say. So what do you see when you read the newspapers? The first is our complaint about modern newspapers covering the horse race and not the issues is a long-standing complaint. <laughs> they were, yes, the 19th century was better in terms of classical music, but it was not better in terms of journalism focused on the issues. Most of the articles that talked about the 14th Amendment were predictions about whether it would pass Congress, individual states. President Johnson sent it to the states with a list of objections there were long discussions about whether this was appropriate. As I mentioned before, there were a great many shenanigans in Tennessee about ratification, as you can imagine. There were long discussions on that. The one thing that is interesting is today, John Bingham, the person responsible for Section 1, is considered the father of the 14th Amendment. John Bingham has no special mention in Tennessee newspapers. And when he gives a speech, they, they copy down the speech. The 14th Amendment is about Thaddeus Stevens. There are just articles that say Thaddeus Stevens best guy ever. He's given us the 14th Amendment, and there are articles that say this is the devil. But if there's one figure they focus on, it's Thaddeus Stevens. And this actually helped explain something to me, that the generation before me, when writing about the 14th Amendment, tended to say the emphasis on the radicals, and Thaddeus Stevens was a radical, has been too much. And I didn't quite understand why. Reading the papers, no, I, I do think they exaggerate the impact of Stevens, but only slightly. But for them, the 14th Amendment is a victory of a radical, moderate coalition. So what do they say? Well, let's start with the star of our show, section one. First thing is, I cannot find in Tennessee over 800 articles, at least 400 of which talked about the 14th Amendment, an article devoted, even three paragraphs, to section one. Section one gets mentioned in speeches that say, I'm going to go through the 14th Amendment one by one for you. Here's section one, here's section two. There is not a single article that says section one, due process, citizenship, equal protection, privilege and immunity, your con law course, that this is really important. Thank God we have it. In fact, 
one of the most reprinted articles, and by the way, newspapers then reprint articles from other newspapers like you wouldn't believe, and sometimes they even have attribution. <laughs> Not always, but if you want to be a 19th century journalist, work on your plagiarism skills. <laughs> but there's an article from the New York Post that says Section 1 is pointless. Congress can already do all of these things under the 13th Amendment. We don't need the redundancy. That is often reprinted. A second feature of the commentary on Section 1. All of us in con law teach, and we all learn, right? There is the Citizenship Clause, the Due Process Clause, the Privileges and Immunities Clause, the Equal Protection Clause. And I want to thank those of you who are nodding as I said this. You know this, right? There are four separate clauses, and we've got to know all four of them. They don't believe that. Their Equal Protection Clause is one clause. The governor, equal protection of all citizens in the enjoyment of life, liberty, and property. Another. All free men of the United States, except Indians not taxed, shall be citizens equal before the law. Nobody thinks there are four separate clauses. It's one clause, by the way, as we'll get to, described in different ways. Now, one of the questions is, is the 14th Amendment about race. It's rather interesting here. Most of the newspapers that are for the 14th Amendment describe the 14th Amendment in race-neutral ways. Here is, in fact, the Memphis Daily Post, which is the major Republican in between moderate and radical. That's their editorial line. Are you opposed? to conferring civil rights upon all the citizens of the American Republic. Everybody, you, me, whatever. Whereas the Union and American, which was a Johnson outlet, says this will place whites and blacks upon a footing of perfect equality under state authority. So, for Republicans, the emphasis was on universal. For Democrats opposed, it was an anti-race discrimination. This also deals with, does the 14th Amendment incorporate the civil rights? If you are for the 14th Amendment, you don't think it's necessary. That's not what this is about. Only people who are against say it incorporates the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Opposition newspapers say the 14th Amendment, Section 1, also grants the right to vote. Pro-newspapers are silent on that issue. And I raise this as actually an interesting in contemporary debates. In contemporary debates, I've taken some of President Trump's supporters to task because the only people they quote on the original meaning of the 14th Amendment is Democrats who were opposed to it. My own belief is the way you understand the meaning of a constitutional amendment is what do people who favored it thought. Well, if President Trump and the originalists are going to say it's the Democrats that have the right understanding, two things follow, and they're very different things. The first thing is African Americans have a positive right to vote under the 14th Amendment, which they have denied. The second is, despite the 14th Amendment, this is still a white man's government because Democrats were saying it was a white man's government even after the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment passed. I'll leave it to all of you to make sense of this. I can't. Section two. The exciting news, given I had a thesis, is in fact section two is the center of the 14th Amendment in Tennessee. 
and I'll add in the 15 articles I've read in Missouri. It's the centerpiece. People write entire articles on Section 2. Congressman Horace Maynard says it's of prime importance, the great guarantee. This is the focus. The New York Post article that said, eh, to Section 1, said all that the 14th Amendment ought to be about is Section 2. Section 2, they say, is a matter of simple justice. If you do not allow African Americans to vote, you ought not benefit from them being counted. It is also, quite openly, an amendment designed to transfer power northward. The Knoxville Whig. If the basis of representation is change from that which now exists so as to prevent a non-voting population from being represented in Congress, why then the sectional power of the South as a political body will be gone, and even without abolishing the Electoral College, we might hereby reasonably hope for a perpetual union triumph. The Attorney General of the United States at that time was a man named Joshua Speed, who was a good friend of Abraham Lincoln's and a dissenter in the Johnson cabinet. Members of the Johnson cabinet issued opinions saying 14th Amendment, really bad idea. Speed says, I can't do this. And in a public letter that is published in every newspaper in Tennessee or the vast majority, he says, the persistent attempt to keep in the Constitution the rule of an unequal and unfair basis of representation is perilous to the future peace of the country and will surely cause a chafing sense of injuries as long as it is continued. Furthermore, the high mission of the Union Party, as avowed in the Baltimore Convention, to extirpate slavery includes the removal of all the hate and anti-popular excrescences engrafted by that institution for its own selfish aggrandizement upon the free national laws and policy. That high mission and obligation cannot be accomplished until all which slavery has so engrafted is cut out for until then, slavery is not extirpated. Now, I would submit to you, and I need your honesty here, if I had just read that quote and said, what clause is he talking about? Or said, well, of course, section one. He doesn't mention section one in his letter. It doesn't exist. He calls it section two because he said there's some other thing called section one. Who knows what that is? Who cares? Section 2 drives this, and everybody, the opposition, they agree. They think this is a scheme, which it is, to enfranchise persons of color. And what you see in the opposition papers is they try to play New England off against the West because the hot issue with respect to Section 2 is, is Section 2 going to maintain population as the basis of representation, or is it going to move to voters? And New England fights for population. Why? Because New England has literacy requirements. So it actually turns out, as one opposition writer points out, there is, in many ways, a three-fifths clause in New England because at the time it took 24,000 actual voters to elect a congressman in Illinois, but only 16,000 actual voters to elect a congressman in Massachusetts because that was the level of disenfranchisement. 
But by keeping population, you could keep literacy requirements in and other things. So that was what people said. Section three. The original Section 3 disenfranchised all Confederates up until 1870. Everybody hated that. Few things united Tennessee. But the conservatives said, how could you disenfranchise our best people? The radicals said, how could you disenfranchise them only until 1870? And so everybody agreed it was a lousy idea. But Republicans like the new Section 3, which excludes all rebels, as they said, who have held office under the United States government, who took oaths and violated them. The governor says, the third section is intended to prevent the class of rebel leaders from holding office, who by violating their official oaths added one great offense to another. A couple of things about this which are common in the debate. First, the emphasis on the combination shot, treason plus perjury. It's not enough these people committed treason, by violating their oath, they committed perjury. So it's the double that gets you disenfranchised. The second, because this has become a hot issue in Section 3, as some of you may know, Donald Trump has claimed that the president is not an officer of the United States. The president is not an officer under the United States, and the president doesn't take an oath to support the Constitution. The president takes a different oath. Well, listen again to Brownell. The third section is intended to prevent that class of rebel leaders from holding office, who by violating their official oath, I cannot find a single person who thinks the phrase officer of the United States means something different than officer. I cannot find a single person who thinks officer under the United States means something different than officer. I cannot find a single person who, when talking about Section 3, says the oaths are different. They only meant one oath. No, they talk about oath of office, official oath, oath of allegiance. They use lots of different words. So again, they, they're using the generic. Section 4, barely acknowledged. It's there, but here, the reason why I think Section 4 is barely acknowledged, because we'll get to Section 5 in a minute, is there appears to be agreement. That is, you could find people attacking 2 and 3 and saying one gives African Americans the right to vote, we don't like that. But to the extent I found commentary on the opposition, they said rebel debt, yep. The only objection they, they have to Section 4 comes to the New York Post. Of course we're going to pay the union widow. We don't need to say this with a constitutional amendment. Section 5. This is, I think, the most interesting finding. In 45 minutes into the talk, I better have an interesting finding. <laughs> and it's a finding I don't know what to make of it. And would welcome your comments. See, whoever telegraphed the 14th Amendment that was framed by Congress to the rest of the United States left out Section 5. At first, they was puzzling. You know, the Memphis Daily Post, they have this four-section amendment. 
the Memphis Daily Avalanche. It's also four sections. The Maine Augusta News, four sections. The Missouri Republican, four sections. I've got about eight to nine newspapers already, four sections. I do not have a newspaper that in the week after they ratified, Congress passed the 14th Amendment, State, has a five section, 14th Amendment. Not only that, nobody talked about Section 5. There is not a single commentary in Tennessee newspapers about Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. And so here is the puzzle. What's the original public meaning of a provision in amendment that nobody at the time of ratification knew existed. And as we go, right, we, it's a, we haven't thought of because it never would occur to us. They simply left out Section 5. Now, my suspicion is by the time Missouri got around to ratify, somebody said, oh, by the way, there's a fifth thing there. <laughs> but while I found two local newspapers in Tennessee that a month later said, whoops, left out something. The big city newspapers, I can't find the whoops edition. <laughs> I can't find a speech that talks about it. So this is actually a first theme. It's actually a broader theme. That one of the things you see in the Tennessee newspapers is erroneous information is being presented. And by erroneous, I don't mean I disagree with it. So if somebody had said the president is not an officer of the United States, that would not be erroneous information. It would be something I disagree with. When people say the 14th Amendment makes African Americans superior to white people, that's wrong, but it's not erroneous information. But for example, the original 14th Amendment, Section 3, said disenfranchisement until 1870. A great many newspapers reported disenfranchisement until 1876. That's erroneous information. It is not an interpretation of 1870 to say it's really 1876. At least in my way of doing mathematics. I, I gather higher mathematics, you can do this. <laughs> and we should note Section 2. Section 2 quite clearly continues to allocate representation on the basis of population. If you have a high percentage of foreign-born non-citizens in your state, as is the case in New England, they count. Many newspapers and speeches, however, say voters. That's simply wrong. You get two points off on your final exam. <laughs> Section 3 disqualification, persistently misstated. What I mean doesn't apply to military officers. It does. Doesn't apply to these people. It does. These are simply mistakes. And now we've got, I think, the problem again I want to talk about a little bit. How do we understand originalism and consent when there is the serious possibility of erroneous information. A second thing, which I've mentioned, it's very clear their priorities go to three, one, four, five is under the ground somewhere. <laughs> They're not our priorities. Section one is never made the centerpiece. It's often considered unnecessary. The 14th Amendment the framers passed is not a rights amendment. It's a structure amendment. It's a con law one amendment and not a con law two amendment. And why this matters for con law two, remember what the framers say in, for example, Federalist 31, which we all, of course, know by heart, and that is, when you are thinking about government, don't look to rights and powers, look for structure. 
If you get the structure right, you will get the rights and powers right. If you get the structure wrong, it doesn't matter what you say in the rights and powers. That the goal, as Joshua Speed said, was to get rid of slavery hand and foot. But of course we know in the Southern and democratic imagination, there were lots of ways to retain slavery. You couldn't write a piece of text that covered all the ways. What you could do was try to transfer power to people who hated slavery and said, you figure it out as you go along. That's what the 14th Amendment is about. Third point. 14th Amendment is not a lawyer's amendment. Stephen Calabrese, writing, says, the phrase officer of the government is a technical legal phrase. And even if nobody under the time knew it, tough luck. That's not their 14th Amendment. They do not parse section one into equal protection. It means citizens have equal rights. They do not parse section three, what officers do we mean, all officers. There are no technical legal phrases. The union should pay its debts. We all know what paying its debts means. You know, the validity of the public debt, all that means is you pay it. The widow gets her bounty. The widow of the southern soldier doesn't. Simple as that, but it's not a lawyer's constitution. And when we interpret it as a lawyer's constitution, we're doing something other than what they did. And last, the interesting feature of the Tennessee debate, and it's by the way true of the debates of the 14th Amendment in general, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison are writing a constitution to last forever and to solve the problems of mankind. The 14th Amendment framers are trying to get to tomorrow. They are obsessed about their problems, dealing with the black code, dealing with Southern overrepresentation, eliminating the Southern leadership class, paying off the Union soldier. But what's interesting is the 14th Amendment is phrased in universal terms, and quite consciously so. They had a no race discrimination amendment on the floor. They changed it to equal protection, due process for everyone. The original version of Section 3 said people participating in the late rebellion are disqualified. They changed it to insurrection and rebellions more generally. Some version of Section 4 said the debt acquired in the late rebellion shall not be repaid. They change it to the debt of the United States. So they present us with a fascinating challenge. On the one hand, if we're textualists, they wrote for today, but they only thought about yesterday. How do we think about today in light of their words? And as I said, that's your project. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, irrational fear number one. I only had 15 minutes worth of material. That, that proved wrong. Thank you so much. Ready for questions? Thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. And I hope you don't mind. I'm going to read my question to try and be as precise as possible. So as you're uh, making this kind of methodological mood move in assessing the intention of the original workings of the 14th Amendment, how would you respond to the criticism that it's a fool's errand to, sink, to seek a singular sublime and cohesive intention, especially amongst the moderate and Republican co coalition that you mentioned, as Eric Foner in The Second Founding kind of describes they're all working with conflicting constructions, that at the root of this research question about what the 14th Amendment really means is actually a really complicated tangle of sometimes mutually exclusive visions of how the 
amendment was supposed to work, and that unlike perhaps what Kurt Lash would say, the fact that the amendment was passed or ratified um, isn't an expression of compromise, but instead a rhetorical political cunning that relies on taking advantage of the vague realities of language that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk. Therefore, answering to the singular public meaning is a political, not historical act, wherein whatever authority or institution who makes that judgment does so for their own political ends. Uh, I stand with Foner and not with Lash, so my, my temptation is, yes, next question, but <laughs> let, that, that would not do justice to your very sophisticated question. In fact, part of what I'm trying to show is a history problem that doesn't translate into what originalists wanted to translate. So originalists see in the four clauses of section one, they see first four clauses with independent legal meaning established by a series of precedents. I'm showing nobody in Tennessee saw four clauses. They saw one clause with some general meaning, but lots of overlap, and they saw it differently. So lots of different 14th Amendments got supported. Now what's interesting is nobody really fights over the original meaning of Section 2, and I'm sorry, Kurt Lash, no responsible historian fights over the original meaning of Section 3. There isn't anyone who's ever published in a history journal that has challenged fundamental features of Section 3. For the structure sections, the framers actually engage in wordsmithing. They wanted to be precise. For Section 1, it was what Joshua Speed said. Get rid of all remnants of slavery. What are they going to look like? We don't know. Here are vague phrases. They will help you. But if we, understand this, if we understand Section 1 and the 13th Amendment as empowering Republican majorities to get rid of slavery, the slave system, and the slave power, we'll have a better understanding than we go through the legal meaning of each word that the 14th Amendment, and Republicans say this afterwards, it's like McCulloch versus Maryland, the Commerce Clause. That's their analogy. It's not like the Contracts Clause. So that's the long-winded version of, yes, you're correct. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. After 60, 60 years or sort of 40 years in the business, I do long-winded well. Um, I had a, thank you for the talk. It was lovely. Um, I have a question about sort of your, um, the press that you're looking at. Have you gone, because Tennessee is such a complicated place, I mean, beginning in 1862, through the end of the war, and then into Reconstruction, for the editors and the places that you're looking at with the press, have you spent some time looking at you know, who these editors were, where they came from, and sort of the really base communal political realities of the places that they're writing in? You know, the presence of the Union troops, uh, whether or not that has made it in, whether it's central, western, eastern Tennessee, all these divisions. Um, and if you have looked at that, how does that filter into the way they're interpreting and writing the 14th Amendment? Or you haven't looked at it, which is also a fair answer. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are two answers. Once again, there's the short version and the long version. The short version is I haven't looked at it, but I'm going to answer anyway. <laughs> um, the longer version, and the reason why I don't think the presence of Union troops matters much here is in fact even in the same city, Memphis, Nashville, you get papers with the full range of opinions that I've been taught to expect in the South. So you get the Memphis Daily Post, which is the Republican line. You get the Memphis Daily Avalanche, which is somewhere between the Johnson line and a conservative version of it. Nashville has a Johnson paper, a paper to the right of Johnson, and a liberal, the Nashville Free Press, a liberal paper. So I'm guessing, at least in the major cities, the union isn't interfering. 
Knoxville seems to be fairly Whiggish, right. um, but that's where it is. Right. Lo in some ways, where a place is, the more Eastern Tennessee, the more Republican. So the most radical paper is the East, East Tennessee, you know, not, old flag. That's, that's really radical. Most of the Memphis papers outside of the Daily Post are quite conservative. Process question and a normative question about Section 3. What's the right office to decide or to make the ultimate decision for if someone should be disqualified under Section 3? It seems like most people assume federal courts or state courts, ultimately the Supreme Court. Couldn't you say it's the Congress, given that Congress has the authority? make exceptions to this qualification, and Section 5, redundantly given the Necessary and Proper Clause, gives Congress the power to make all relevant legislation. The normative question is, supposing even if the ratifiers of the 14th Amendment emphatically said the President doesn't count in the list of officers who should be uh, eligible for disqualification, that would be dumb. I mean, that would be a ridiculous thing to say because the presidency is the most powerful office. Why would we make that the one exception to maybe entrust to someone who had led a rebellion previously? Why would it be binding on us to follow the judgments offered by the ratifiers as opposed to just saying, this is our best judgment about the Constitution and the goods that it's supposed to advance as expressed in the preamble, who cares about the ratifiers? Second part of the question, I think it's crucial in answering the second part of the question that the framers say, well, of course, the president is exempt, but they use the language they use. Because one of my clear beliefs, there are a lot of things in the Constitution, I think equal state, you know, equal State equality in the Senate is pretty stupid, but it's there. Uh, you just can't get around it. I think we have come up with a better name for the country in the United States of America. Boring. But <laughs> it's you know, there. Um, we get around it. And I think my feeling about this is, and it's not, this is not part of the paper, we start with history and we ask ourselves, Several questions. So you mean you have to tell people? First, okay. yeah. has anything changed in the life world such that a phrase used then would have a different application today? Because unlike originalists, I'm of the theory of language that languages do not exist word by word. Lang the rules of a game have meaning within the game itself. If you change the game, you change the meaning. And so the meaning of cruel and unusual changes. It's a very simple way I like to say it. Uh, and I apologize. This almost comes with a trigger warning. It's that bad. One of the kids who swam with my daughters was tragically killed. Parents have never looked the same to me. It's been 25 years. And I you know, see in people's faces this. Abraham Lincoln lost two kids while he was there. It was common to lose children. Now we all expect we're going to outlive our children. Death penalty in a world where people expect to outlive their children is very different when you expect you won't out, that half your children will die before you do. So that's a simple. Way. Now, with well, remind me your first question again. The process. Yeah. Okay. Now I just that, that what I said. Okay. Here is what they thought. Again, this goes beyond the paper, and we have to remember that John Roberts doesn't read history. John Roberts says we would never trust ex-Confederate states to make rules on race or rules on disqualification. 
But there are a couple of problems with this. First, in 1866, they had no representation in Congress. So when Clarence Thomas said, you see, you can't show a single Confederate in 1866 who was disqualified, that's because we can't show a single Confederate representative state that had representation in Congress. <laughs> OK? So they get representation. Why did they get representation? They ratified the 14th Amendment, and they agreed to African-American suffrage. And by the way, many of them, like Tennessee, still have laws disenfranchising former rebels. If you look at the congressional delegations to Congress in 1870, the former Confederate states are the most radical. And by the way, half of their senators, or not quite half, are African-American former slaves. Anyone worried about their loyalty? So the idea was that the states would act first. And if Congress didn't like what the states were doing, Congress could pass legislation. What is interesting, first, in the 400 or so articles I've read, Tennessee and the 100 or so articles I've read outside, nobody has mentioned judicial enforcement. Now, I want to emphasize, nobody has mentioned judicial enforcement. That means nobody has said it will be enforced by the judiciary. Nobody says it won't be enforced by the judiciary. That's not on their mind. They're not thinking that. They're thinking states, federal government. Now, it may be a wacky scheme. But remember, at this time, election day was held at all different days. There was no national election day. And so Lincoln was not on the ballot. In many states, there would have been nothing nutty in 1870 in an election where a major party candidate was only on the ballot in some states. Now again. We have to ask what I think of the two questions. Has something in the life world changed? Does that change require rethinking our understanding of the meaning of the language? The good news for me is I'm a legal historian. My job is to say, here's what their life world was. Your job is to figure out what has changed and does that require a change in our understanding. Check and confirm that the mic is not working. So my question is, given your suggestion about the preeminence of Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, uh, this is all super fascinating, did you come across anything that talked about that section's effective disenfranchisement of women? Uh, and I'm totally conjecturing here, but was there any reason to think that women were more likely to become Southern sympathizers or to be Southern sympathizers and thereby that be some sort of explanation as to why Section 2 introduces for the first time male into the Constitution and seems to then effectively suggest that women are disenfranchised? Oh, wi women are there, but they're, they're not there in the way you think. Here is the problem. We have some evil states in the West. They're thinking of doing something like enfranchising women. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> now here's the problem. If you have a scheme that allocates representation by voters, well, any Western state would say only two representatives in the House. You can get four. Or actually then, given the number of women, you can get three by enfranchising women. They are very conscious about this. And the reason why population is chosen rather than voters is they do not want an inducement. And the reason why it has to say male voters, because otherwise, again, if a state enfranchises women, they get a representational bonus. So that's why male is in there. It's rather interesting, and in some ways a sad commentary. Thaddeus Stevens, when this is first proposed, says, you introduced the word male in the Constitution over my dead body. He died the month the 14th Amendment was ratified, I think. <laughs> you know, it's one of those, 
one of the, I'll, I'll argue actually, um, Thaddeus Stevens, well, not even that. It's really fascinating to me. I think if we want a hero politician and somebody who was of a politician, Stevens was the master of figuring out exactly how far you could go for racial equality, gender equality, for many of the good things in the world. And guess what? I can't go here. And putting together the coalition. If we had a 14th Amendment that was Thaddeus Stevens centered in the way our Constitution is James Madison centered, it'd be a very different constitutional order that it's rather interesting.